we've done the prevention stuff with, you know, with everything that everyone knows about. That hasn't worked. We've got COVID now. What do we do? Well, what we try to do is cocoon. So you need to, you know, isolate so you don't give it to anyone that you're in close uh, contact with. But cocooning means as best you can decreasing the stress in your life. Now, of course, it's stressful to be ill and have COVID. But if you're stressed and have COVID, you have to let go of work related stressors. You have to let go of any other things as much as possible that that you can do. Um, and then you want to eat well. So this is a time where you're not overeating and you know the this whole adage about chicken soup is a good thing right yeah 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 you know Delicious. so yeah yeah so you know that kind of thing works well but you're not don't binge on sugar and donuts and all that sort of stuff that's you know something you don't want to do and then there's the role of supplements and there's a lot of supplements um, that IFM has discussed. They're on our website, ifm.org forward slash COVID. People can dig into that however much they like. But some of the biggies, you know, would be vitamin D, quercetin, glutathione or NAC, zinc. Those are, those are the biggies and, and melatonin. Three years ago, a virus changed our entire world. Since then, we have had on our minds, what can we do to protect ourselves? And how can we optimize our immune system using lifestyle medicine? That is what we are discussing with today's guest, Dr. Joel Evans. Joel is a board certified OBGYN and international lecturer and is director of the Center for Functional Medicine in Stamford, Connecticut. Dr. Evans is also senior advisor to Amy Mack, the CEO of the Institute for Functional Medicine and the co-director of the IFM Resistance, Resilience and Recovery Patient Care in a Pandemic course on COVID-19. He now leads the functional medicine response at the IFM to post-acute COVID-19 and has co-authored two recently published papers on the pandemic, with a third recently submitted for publication. I am Dr. Andrew Wong co-founder of Capital Integrative Health. This is a podcast dedicated to transforming the consciousness around what it means to be healthy and understanding the root causes of disease and wellness. And today we're gonna be focusing on COVID. Join us please for how we discuss how functional medicine approaches COVID-19 and how lifestyle medicine can help to optimize your immune system. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Evans for coming on and uh... We are really honored to have you here on our podcast, uh, Joel, or Dr. Evans. He is the Chief of Medical Affairs of the Institute for Functional Medicine, among many other honors and accolades. Uh, and I think first, let's just talk about that for a sec. Uh, you're Chief of Medical Affairs for IFM. Uh, let's talk about what that means. And uh, maybe for those listening, I know we have a lot of practitioners out there listening, but for the audience, what is the Institute for Functional Medicine? Uh, kind of, and then what do you do with the organization? So that's a, a great question to start off with, Andy. And, you know, functional medicine, as I'm sure your listeners know, are, is something that is really taking quite a hold in the interest of the general public. And the Institute for Functional Medicine is the foremost educational institution for healthcare practitioners in functional medicine. And we are teaching not only physicians, but nurse practitioners, acupuncturists, nurses, chiropractors, and many other different types of healthcare practitioners. And so what I do as Chief of Medical Affairs is really uh, look at what we're doing medically in terms of what's happening in the world. So what are the health issues confronting the world and it's COVID. And so I've been in charge of the 
COVID initiative. Um, initially, I was co-directing a course and now pretty much have been put in charge of our COVID initiative. And functional medicine, as your listeners know, really is about how the body functions. And we talk about how the body functions in relation to all sorts of chronic disease. And I'm sure you remember as you were coming up through the ranks and just learning, we would talk about diabetes, heart disease, migraines, neurologic disease, all the diseases that are becoming more common in the United States. And then we would show you how the way the body functions determines whether a person even gets an issue, has symptoms, the symptoms develop to be a diagnosed disease. It's sort of a spectrum, right? Then along came COVID. And this was a brand new illness and we're all aware how allopathic physicians or conventional medicine really struggled with treating people, right? The death rate, they, it, was, it was really something that was horrendous. And at the same time, it was the perfect opportunity for us to demonstrate the role of functional medicine, both in helping people to prevent getting COVID or, and we do that by strengthening immune health, et cetera. So we don't say, oh, this will prevent it, but we use the term help mitigate it or help reduce the risk or help reduce the likelihood. And then we talk about how you can reduce the likelihood of a severe infection. And then we talk about how we can reduce the likelihood of getting long COVID. And then if you have long COVID, we talk about how we can reduce the symptomatology. So what's nice about this overlap of COVID with functional medicine is that it gives us an opportunity almost as a example or exemplar case of how functional medicine can have real utility in the face of a pandemic. Thank you, Joel, for that great intro here. Uh, I know that um, for the listeners too, just like you said in the beginning, when we look at the page of educators of the IFM, it really spans all disciplines, medical doctor, naturopathic doctor, MP, PA, RNs, um, nutritionists, you know, um, DCs, right? You, you know, just, just yep. everyone really. Um, and, and when you look at, when you look at that, really it's because of the, the lens through which we view the body, the physiology, the root causes. And then, like you said, to connect the dots between functional medicine and COVID-19, really it's not only about the bugs, but it's about the terrain, meaning the, the you know, health of the organism, the re resiliency. And you know, functional medicine does it's such a great job of that. Um, I think you know, we can really work with <clears throat> our conventional colleagues to ideally sy synergistically, or you know, certainly there's, there's some role, of, of course, for all different types of medicine, but it really sounds like you know, the functional approach for, you know, for COVID is, is so relevant. And I mean, it has been the last few years, but it's really become, I think, much more clear in the, in the past year, especially that we really need to work on the terrain to really get, you know, to really get past this, I, I think. Yeah, that's, that's so true. And what's interesting is we know this intuitively because pre-COVID, if you were talking to a patient about, let's say, influenza, you would say, you know, whether you get a vaccine or not is a separate conversation, but with or without the vaccine, because we know the vaccines aren't perfect in preventing influenza, but we would say the best thing you could do to prevent influenza or to reduce the severity should you get it is to be as healthy as you can be. And it, the same is it, true. It, exactly. And even, even on the data for influenza, right? There's studies that show that if you get more sleep, then the vaccine is going to take better. 
and then you know that's why even um, there's there's recommendations now that you know people with uh, more immunocompromised maybe they need a higher dose of the vaccine you know for the flu I, vaccine. I gotta tell you that little snippet about sleep before flu vaccine that is such an interesting um, body of medical research, you know, vaccine efficacy and modifying vaccine efficacy. So when the COVID vaccines first came out, that's something that I, you know, really dug into that, that literature. And a lot of it comes out of uh, Ohio State, actually. Um, Interesting. And, and we almost had um, one of their uh, lead researchers as, as a guest and it just didn't work out for one of our webinars, um, Dr. Kiko Glazer. And um, what we found is in the literature, there is so much information on vaccine efficacy with hepatitis vaccine, with flu vaccine, and it's sleep, it's stress, and most people don't even know about that, but it's Not, but it yeah. is really well documented in the literature, and so we then use that in our message to say if you choose to get a COVID vaccine, these are the things we think you should do. Not that it's been proven to be helpful or of any benefit with COVID vaccine, but it's been shown to be effective with other vaccines. So why not? How can it hurt you? To yeah. Get sleep, right? More sleep, less stress. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. There's a great study on stress that if you're stressed when you get a um, get a vaccine, it doesn't take as well. Hmm. Yeah. So so got to do some meditation. It sounds like before the uh, before the vaccine. Yeah. Yeah. So, so let's kind of go into that a little deeper now in terms of how the terrain affects the, of the immune system rather, affects our ability to be resilient against this virus, which now we're, I think, working on Omicron BA4 and 5. Four and 5, yeah. You know, so, so like when is it going to end? I think we're all kind of getting, I know I'm going to getting tired of, you know, reading about it even, and, and then obviously we're living it too. So there's a, there's a couple of things and we can talk about, you know, four and five. Now we can talk about four and five at the end because there's, there's some important things about four and five. And actually they're so important. I want to mention them now because they're up front. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. It's so important. We need to put it up front. And that is um, it's very, very, very transmissible. So, as we are getting variations or mutations, we're getting increased transmissibility. Luckily with that, we're also getting decreased severity of illness or decreased virulence. However, one of the things that we're losing is we're losing natural immunity that may have occurred from previous infection. So if you've had an Omicron infection or even a COVID infection from a non-Omicron variant, sort of a pre-Omicron variant, you are not going to be protected. And so that's very important because what I hear from my patients is I've had COVID, I don't need to worry anymore. That is not true. It does it, not. Yeah. Well, well there, there's an immune evasion that's happening, right? With all the different spike well, that's, mutations. That's what I mean, right? Immune yeah. evasion is the technical term. Yeah. And the, the lay term is not non-protected. Non-protected, non-protected. So, so what is the IFM or what is, what is you know, Dr. Evans here? What do, you, what do you recommend for how to deal with uh, BA4 and 5, which is the current ones uh, as we're taping this right now well, in June 2022? It's you really... You, nothing changes. It's the same thing, which is number one, try to be as healthy as possible. Mm -hmm. Because we know that the chronic illnesses that are so prevalent really affect not only immune function, 
but also affect the likelihood of getting COVID and the likelihood of getting severe COVID. So I don't know about you and your practice, but I've got a lot of, whether we call them pre-diabetic, metabolic syndrome, a lot of patients running around with insulins that are higher than they should be, blood sure. sugars that are higher than they should be. You talk about national numbers between, you know, 30% of the population, something, you know, so it's a significant number of people. And if they could just put the pedal to the metal and be motivated to do things, and you know what you tell your patients are the same things I tell your patients, but getting that blood sugar as close to normal as possible is so important. And not only will it make them healthier and less likely to develop diabetes, but it'll also help them with this protection against COVID. So it's a, it's a win-win, but that's the most important thing, normalizing blood sugar. And it's not a COVID specific intervention, but it's something that helps COVID significantly. And so when we look at the risk factors for severe COVID, it's body weight and blood sugar. And these things, make a, a tremendous difference, right? If you're normal weight, you have a 63% reduced risk of severe COVID, you know? And, and the same is true with normalizing blood sugar, you know, where it's 35% to a, of a severe disease, but 70% protection against pain. No so, medicine. So, that's yeah, no, no, no pill can do that, that I, I know of. Yeah. Correct. Um, is there, is there any data on optimizing blood sugar path, like lower than a hundred? So let, let's say blood sugar is like 95 or something. And then the, you know, patients like, well, I'm, I'm, I don't have a high blood sugar, you know, but, but then they're still like kind of metabolically off. Well, you know, that's a great question. And that's where I would say functional medicine would, would answer this in this way. No, there's no data because the data is those with abnormal versus you know, elevated primarily. But there's what we call biologic plausibility. And what biologic plausibility means in normal language is it makes sense. So it makes sense to have as healthy a blood sugar level as possible. Even though I can't give you a statistic about how much better you'll do, it makes sense because having an elevated blood sugar makes all the COVID parameters worse and also decreases immune function. So <clears throat> I kind of want to cover this at some point. So I kind of want to talk about it now just because it's in my head right now and hard to get out of my head. It almost, sound, it almost feels like a virus. You know, sometimes ideas are like viruses, you know, you can't yes, get them out of yes. your head. Um, where do you see the pandemic going? And, and we can also touch on this at the end because this is a very broad type of question, you know, with the different variants and is this gonna still kind of spin off kind of like flu, flu variants every year? Or what are your thoughts about, about Omicron and future variants of COVID? Yeah, so what's interesting is, um, and I'm not just saying this, but the truth is we just don't know, right? And what that means, what that means is that it depends on what we can't quantify, which is the variance. What's gonna happen with the variance? Because variance, are random events, right? So this virus just keeps replicating in people. And unfortunately, one of the reasons we keep getting more new variants is because this virus becomes more and more transmissible. As it's more and more transmissible, it's in more people. As it's in more people, it keeps replicating more. As it keeps replicating more, you're at increased risk for these random events, these random mutations that change it. So we just don't know. What we do know is viral infections like the flu can increase in the fall 
and the winter months. So we're sort of expecting that. And that's just because of the behavior where colder weather, people are indoors, et cetera. So what I suspect is that there will be an increase in the fall because the pattern of mutations so far has declared itself as something that continues to happen. Mm -hmm. Because these mutations continue to happen, I expect them to continue to happen and we'll see, you know, in the fall. The concern, of course, is with these variations or these, um, these mutations, what if we get one that's both more transmissible and more severe? Yeah. And that's my fear. But thankfully, conventional medicine has stepped up to the plate and Paxlovid is something that seems to work with minimal severe side effects. Yeah, yeah. And it seems to be now much more widely available than yes. initially, you know. Correct. Different pharmacies and all that. Um, let, let's say someone gets COVID or, you know, it's certainly something that even Dr. Fauci was like, we're all gonna get COVID, you know, at some point. What would you as a functional medicine doctor, functional medicine leader here, uh, chief of medical affairs of IFM, what would you say, Joel, for a person that, you know, has some COVID and, you know, obviously we, we, we don't think this is a, this podcast is not a medical treatment podcast. So talk to your practitioner about these things. But um, if someone has COVID kind of run of the mill, they're not, their oxygen's okay. And, you know, things like that. Right. So that, um, that's an important part, Andy. And we have to stress that, that you as as a patient can't know whether you fall in this category of high risk or not. And so that's where a medical appointment is, is, is important. Because, is needed. Yeah. 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 We have to figure that out. Um, and if you're like most people, um, it's a low risk situation where you're not going to need to go to the hospital. You're not going to be on a ventilator. You're not going to be in an ICU. And in those cases, that's where outpatient Paxlovid is a great treatment. And that's done in addition to uh, the functional medicine nutraceutical approach. So we really um, look at our approaches as, as foundational. So we've done the prevention stuff with, you know, with everything that everyone knows about. That hasn't worked. We've got COVID now. What do we do? Well, what we try to do is cocoon. So you need to, you know, isolate so you don't give it to anyone that you're in close uh, contact with. But cocooning means as best you can decreasing the stress in your life. Now, of course, it's stressful to be ill and have COVID, but if you're stressed and have COVID, you have to let go of work-related stressors. You have to let go of any other things as much as possible that, that you can do. Um, and then you want to eat well. So this is a time where you're not overeating and you know the this whole adage about chicken soup is a good thing right yeah 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 you know Delicious. so yeah yeah so you know that kind of thing works well but you're not don't binge on sugar and donuts and all that sort of stuff that's you know something you don't want to do and then there's the role of supplements and there's a lot of supplements um, that IFM has discussed. They're on our website, ifm.org forward slash COVID. People can dig into that however much they like. But some of the biggies, you know, would be vitamin D, quercetin, glutathione or NAC, zinc. Those are... Those are the biggies and, and melatonin. 
What about vitamin C? Anything there for us? Vitamin C is great too. Vitamin C is great too. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. That that's a good starting point for for supplements, and obviously the same things. Trying, like you said, uh, getting enough sleep, avoiding sugar, uh, trying to decrease stress, or increase resilience. Uh, what about what about um, what about cooked foods versus raw foods? You know, I know in traditional Chinese medicine, it's it's usually about trying to do warming foods and, and these type of things and not so much raw. So I'm, I'm just curious about your thoughts on. So, you know, raw foods. I am one of the, I, I am never too proud to admit when I don't know something. And so that's an area in which I would say I am not an expert. So if you are, or if you're not a practitioner and you go to a practitioner that is an expert in this area, I would follow the advice of that expert. There's no literature that I'm aware of um, on that, but I am aware of the traditional Chinese medicine, you know, philosophies of, you know, of cooling and warming. And, and I will tell you that in my own personal life with the practitioner I work with, that's real and, and, it, it's valid to me. I just don't have the knowledge base of that. Yeah, got it, got it. Well, I love the humility there. I know you've been uh, researching this up the wazoo, but I think any good practitioner is gonna gonna say what they know and say what they don't know, right? That's that's really a good thing. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Evans. Um, how does the gut? Now, now we're gonna get into the the big topics like um, how does the gut impact the immune system and at risk of COVID. What do you think about microbiome balance and COVID? Is there anything there in the research? So yes, there is a lot there. So um, what I would say is there's a basic principle in functional medicine predating COVID that the gut is the biggest immune organ of the body. And therefore gut health is intimately tied to immune health. So we've known about that for many, many years. Then comes COVID and we find out that COVID actually infects the gut. Mm -hmm. And before there was widespread COVID testing, what they did is they would do testing in sewage treatment plants for COVID. And they were able to tell weeks in advance the areas where there would be COVID peaks. So here you have the fact that the gut is the biggest immune organ of the body and COVID infects that organ of the body. And yes, digestive symptoms are part of it, but not always. But there's COVID in the gut with, an, with or without digestive symptoms. It, it sounds like a carrier organ. Um, I, I know we were talking about this uh, functional um, stool micro, you know, stool test uh, that I think you, you and I know what we're talking about on this, but, um, and they do that, that PCR for, for uh, SARS-CoV-2, you know, uh, I haven't used that too much. I don't know if you, you have, or, well, or I don't, because or, I haven't found it helpful. You haven't, but yeah. So it's like, I guess we have to assume that, because I'm always wondering too with people is that, you know, are they really cleared? You know, the CDC says you can stop quarantining after five days, wear a mask for another five days. But I wonder how many people have COVID kind of latently in there. And this is where the bridge might come at some point in this conversation, the long COVID, but, you know, or past, you know, like, like you're talking about. Um, in other words, I wonder if some of these other organs are, end up being reservoirs for COVID and then that can lead to, to some sort of long COVID situation. Well, actually it is, you know, they've done some biopsies actually um, in infants and found actual replicating SARS-CoV-2 virus in the GI tract. Hmm. Um, okay. A little disturbing, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's a carrier. Um, and it's still actively multiplying. And, and the challenge there is when we look at long COVID, we don't know what the relationship is to infection. Meaning, is the infection gone? 
And these are just post-infectious sequelae or there's just damage in different organ systems from the infection. Or is there sort of a latent long-term infection that's actually happening? And the reason we say that that's a possibility is because when the uh, mRNA vaccines first came out, there was this phenomenon of seeing people recover from long COVID after mRNA vaccine. And the reason for that was it was postulated that the vast antibody response generated by the vaccine killed off yeah. the small yeah. amount of virus that was still replicating in the person. Yeah. So that, that's so interesting. Yeah. Um, and I know there's a lot of information on on the uh, IFM website about PASC or, or long COVID. If we can get into that a bit, I know that, that a lot of people are interested in that. Um, even with a reduced severity of the virus, like with Omicron now, it's, it's spreading more, uh, it's more transmissible, but then less uh, severe acutely. But then I think people are still um, concerned about long COVID, the possibility of getting COVID. I think I just read something that, you know, there's studies that done that you know, up, up to, I think even a third of people have symptoms even after three months or something, a crazy number like that. So what are your thoughts yeah, actually, on, the, yeah. Actually even more. Yeah. The good news is the latest study, which came out, I think a week or seven or 10 days ago, is that in these newer variants, it appears that long COVID is less frequent. So that's some good news. So not only is severity less, but long COVID is less. But that's one paper. It's preliminary data. We're not really ready to say that's the way it is, but at least it's some good news. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if they, if um, the researchers may start to uh, separate out uh, sort of conventionally, you know, labeling COVID as different um, variants versus functionally how that's doing, like someone that's hospitalized with Delta or Omicron, let's say, you know, and, and so it's really not about the variant, but about what happened to them, and how severe it was. Well, we and know the more severe the illness, the more likely for long COVID. That makes sense. That makes sense. So what is the IFSM's approach without, you know, going through the whole website of yeah, well, the research? The, 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 it's, it's the basics. It's nothing that would surprise anybody that went to our training, which is reduce inflammation, help the mitochondria work, reduce free radicals or reduce oxidative stress, gut health, which is our way of looking at immune health and microvascular health and cell membrane health. Yeah, that pretty, pretty much covers it. Um, one other question about that, would you consider more like treating latent viruses with antimicrobials, either, um, I guess, maybe botanicals and things like that? I do. So this is one of those cases where I might use that stool test, for example, to see if there's still SARS-CoV in, um, in the stool that would then make me believe there's still some active infection. So that's a, a sweet spot for that test, I believe. Mm -hmm. But I, yeah. I do believe, yeah. you know, so we're doing a study with a major medical center on the functional medicine approach to long COVID. And so we are not able to personalize. We have to give the same regimen to all comers. And so we have to give anti-inflammatories, mitochondrial support, free radical support, gut support microvascular support, and then immune support. And we're using mushroom extract because that will help the immune system, right? So we're, we're yeah. targeting all the different possibilities about what's going on and giving an intervention in that area. Would I want or ever give a patient one of those and everything? No. I talk to them and find out what's bothering them yeah. and then try to figure out how to intervene. 
want to get a little deeper into one of those topics you mentioned, which is microvascular support. We know that there's decreased glutathione, and then there's also decreased probably nitric oxide. There's different, you know, I think uh, enos goes down and things like that. So what is your, what is your thought about, you know, are, I know some of the protocols out there um, indicate not only nitric oxide boosting support, but also even anticoagulation. I'm curious your thoughts about, about that for, for long COVID, let's say. Yeah, so I don't actively anticoagulate unless someone has a positive D-dimer or um, has had a positive D-dimer or has a history of a thrombotic event um, in the past. So I don't do anticoagulation, but I do push hard on nitric oxide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there's really no downside to that. I mean, it's sort of like the, the cells need more circulation, the tissues need more circulation. What do you think about, about the idea of, um, some I've heard recently, I uh, just wanted to see what your thoughts are also on, um, on like biofilms and like this idea of fibrin biofilms. I don't know if you've got, come across that at all and whether or not that has a role in long COVID or COVID in general, I think. I think theoretically it could. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if it really does. I think that you get to a point, there's only so many interventions you can give for so many different- Patients things. will not take uh, 30 things, yes. Right, that and I think, it's, yeah. I think it's more important to do what we just talked about, like the mitochondria, the reducing inflammation, the sleep, the gut health, et cetera. But then if you get to a place where your patient is plateauing, as if you were a doctor, if you were a patient, if you get to a place where you're just not getting any better, yeah. Then you need to look at these other things. Yeah. So that's when I would look at that. Yeah. That makes sense. So we talked about different nutrients. We talked about nutrition, uh, avoiding, avoiding sugar. Uh, let's go get into protein for a second. What are your general protein recommendations? Should people eat more to try to build, build up, you know, after COVID or does it really matter there on the protein? You know, I, I think that you want to get an adequate amount of protein and that's you know a difficult number to come up with so sure. is it you know a half a gram per kilogram um is it a you know gram per kilogram you know everyone's different depending mm -hmm. on yeah you know, what your, your status is. But the one thing you don't do is go on a low protein, you know, diet. So nor, you know, protein intake is critically important for immune function. When you're ill, you have a higher protein requirement. Um, so I think going up on protein is what I tell my patients to do. Yeah. And that's why you're lucky that you have a nutritionist with you. So you can tell them what that means. Um, same for me. That's another area where um, I defer to my my team. Yeah, yeah. Nutrition is really key, and so having nutritionists to really guide, expertly guide people is really helpful. But you know what I tell my nutrition, my nutritionist, and what I'm sure you tell your patients. So we just talked about, you know, pushing nitric oxide because we want that to go up. Well, dark leafy greens, pomegranate, and beets will help nitric oxide. Yeah. Right. yeah, yeah, that's that's definitely where to start for sure. Um, and then on the vitamin D question, you know, we had Dr. Frame on here. I don't know if you know Dr. Frame at GW, but she's a PhD. She's done her dissertation on vitamin D. She's really big into that. And a lot of the meta analyses, it sounds like it's suggesting that a serum level twenty five OHD of 50 nanograms per deciliter or higher was more protective against, you know, prevention of COVID or prevention of severe COVID, uh, Spanish meta-analysis, et cetera, et cetera. Do you have a target for that type of, you know, D, D level? Um, I know this is kind of a, going back to prevention now, but I'm just kind of curious about yeah, that. Well, since... I mean, and then there's the data though, the intervention data. Yeah. They give high dose. Oh, D. right. No, that's right. That's right. You know, so it, it's not just prevention, it's also treatment. And so, you know, I, I'll give 
um, you know, I always check a vitamin D, but I'll give 50,000 a week. Um, you know, to me, that's pretty high dose or 70,000 a week, you know, 10,000 a day, you know, during acute, during the acute phase. Yeah. Yeah. It kind of ramps up the immune system. Yeah. 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 But I check, I check levels. I'll give more if they're low, but I check levels in that case, because I don't want to get too high. You know, I don't want them going over a hundred. And uh, yeah, so that's the vitamin D. So I know that for, let's touch on vaccines for a second. So I know that there are people working on pan coronavirus vaccines. I don't know if you have any more data on that at this point, but I'm, I'm curious your thoughts about where we're headed with vaccines, you know, cause we're still, we're still in the, in the era, I think of boosting, but the boosting is of the original formulations right now, I believe. Yeah. And that is actually being changed right now as we speak. Um, so there's a lot of vaccine work going on because many people believe this is going to become similar to influenza, meaning it's going to become endemic and not a pandemic. It's just going to be out there. And so people are looking for different types of vaccines. Um, and one of the the technical term for what you talked about is called a multivalent vaccine, which is a vaccine that attacks different aspects of the coronavirus spike protein, not just one, because that's what the differences are with the viruses is that spike protein, that part that attaches to our cells, to our ACE2 receptors is different. So there's theoretical data and biologic plausibility that these multivalent vaccines are going to be more, even more effective. And so that's, that's promising. Um, and, uh, you know, now the question is how many boosts or boosters should somebody be getting? And I don't think there's a good answer. I think that if you are someone that's high risk, meaning if you were to get it, you were more likely to be hospitalized, die, or go to the ICU, you may need the booster. If you're not, then you should just practice good, what we would call social distancing, preventive measures, stay healthy, take, take supplements, and you could potentially avoid the booster, but I'm not trying to officially say don't get boosted. Right. I'm just saying there's more room <clears throat> for personalization and individualization in the decision-making process. Let's go back to, thank you so much, um, Joel. Uh, let's go back to Paxlovid for a second. So it is, it does seem to be pretty well tolerated. It's available, you know, for people. Um, you had mentioned before that that's something you would use first line. Is that you would use that first line for not only high risk, but also lower risk yes. people with COVID, uh, which, which I, I also do as well. But um, I know FDA, I think they kind of say use it for high risk more. What are your thoughts well, about, about that? Yeah. Well, I think they say it because it's limited and because there's so much COVID going out there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Supply and demand. Yeah. Right, so I understand why from a public health perspective, um, they wanna do that. But, but when I'm working with a patient in front of me, my obligation is to do the best I can for that patient in front of me. And when we say low risk people don't die, it doesn't mean low risk people never die. Right, got it. Yeah. And yeah. so I wanna make sure that that doesn't happen to my patient. The other thing is, I, in theory, you know, if 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 you get a medication that's inhibiting viral repl replication, you add on some nutrients that help with that, like zinc, you know, boost the C, the glutathione, the vitamin D, then then you're in theory reducing the severity and then a, and then decreasing chance of long COVID as well. That's Absolutely. that's what I think about there too. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, you know, this is a good overview. There's probably thousands of different rabbit holes we can <laughs> we can get through on COVID. Um, just wanted to thank you for coming on, spending some time with us today. 
But we do have some fun questions for you now, uh, Joel, if you don't mind all of our guests. Uh, so we do talk about morning routines because morning routines set the foundation for the day and really promote health, right? And we're talking, in, especially in the beginning of this podcast about how we wanna support the terrain. We wanna support the immune system for whatever is gonna get thrown at it that day, right? So what is Dr. Evans' uh, morning routine, if you don't mind uh, sharing that? Well, I'm laughing. I'm laughing because I just got into a conversation with a functional medicine colleague about, do you need to make your bed or should you make your bed in the morning? And uh, there's a lot of people who believe that that's so critically important just in terms of psychological, emotional approach. Yeah. And I would never argue with that. But then I just saw a study saying that you actually should have an unmade bed because when you have the covers open, whatever sweat that you produced at night will evaporate and the bacteria will die. And if you keep the bed too tight, you know, tightly made, that those bacteria don't disappear. So um, when you talk about morning routine, that's the first thing. So, so, so the bed becomes a biofilm, essentially. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so that's just, that's just a, a lighthearted, humorous way to start the answer to your question. Yeah, there's always but, two answers to, this, to the question, right? To any right, question. Right. So, so uh, but for anyone that's wondering, I've stopped making my bed for that reason. Now, um, after that, what I want to do, you know, I think we all know about the importance of good oral hygiene. And so I'll spend time, you know, brushing my teeth, um, water picking my teeth, because um, I think that that's very important. I will uh, have a personal meditative practice. And part of that meditative practice um, involves you know, quieting my mind through, you know, some deep breaths or repetition of, you know, different words or phrases. Um, and then when I'm done with that, um, I try to get myself to feel gratitude because gratitude is an emotion that has tremendous physiological benefits. And it's even been shown that it's the most beneficial emotion um, that one can have. So I force myself to have gratitude. It doesn't matter how stressed I am or what the circumstances are in my life. I force myself to find things to be grateful. And then I sort of push hard because I want to get myself close to the point of tears with gratitude. That's the amount of gratitude that I try to feel every day. I'm not telling you I'm successful and that I cry every morning in my meditation, but I really push it hard to try to, that, to get that close. So I do gratitude followed by um, an understanding of surrender, that I can't control things. Yeah. And, you know, and then I have a personal belief about, you know, asking to be of service, just a general shout out, you know, can I be of, you know, service and help those um, that I come into contact with. So, yeah, um, you know, that's my morning meditation ritual. Then three to four days a week um, will be physical exercise. Um, I don't eat breakfast um, because I do time-restricted eating. So I try to eat between 12 and six if possible, or 12 and eight, um, but I'll have black coffee. I enjoy my coffee. Every day there's another study about the benefits of coffee. And uh, so that's my morning. And then, um, I'm in a place to start um, my day, either seeing patients or doing work for IFM. 
Awesome, what a beautiful description, the morning routine. And it sounds like you kind of keep it varied, but also there's some consistency to it in terms of like some of the categories and especially the gratitude. I love the description of the gratitude and, you know, moving you to tears. I mean, that, that's just so good for, you know, body, mind, spirit. So thank you for sharing that. One, one other question about, um, I, I have to ask you this, uh, since you've done a lot of research, you know, on the IFM protocols, if, if you were on a desert island and you needed three supplements and you had to pack them all along with everything else you're taking, you know, what would they, what would they be for you? Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. Well, I'm going to say that because it's a desert island, I'll be in the sun and I won't need to take vitamin D. And there's fish, you know, if you eat fish or anything, right. there's, there's some right. fish. So, right. Um, and there'll probably be a fair amount of greens. So I wouldn't need, um, you know, to worry about that. And I wouldn't need to worry about folic acid and, um, my magnesium and stuff like that. So that would lead me to say, um, and that would also be prebiotics. I'm just thinking out loud here. Yeah, yeah, it's a tropical island. There's definitely, and, there's and definitely prebiotics, plants. Prebiotics in many cases are better for you than probiotics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, so what I would say is I probably couldn't get uh, quercetin, and uh, that would be one of my biggies. Um, curcumin would be one of my biggies. Um, and uh, probably NAC. Um, okay. Glutathione. Yeah, yeah. Of course, it tend to help with antiviral effect or antihistamine or what? what yeah, but think? also there's a lot of cursed benefits to quercetin um, in the anti-aging literature. Oh, okay, okay. Or, or optimizing nice. literature. Optimizing, yeah, yeah. Um, is quercetin, just to go back to COVID for a second, is, is quercetin one of your biggies for, for COVID? I know we see yeah, a lot that's, of protocols. That's, yeah, yeah. That's a big one. Okay. And it's been shown to actually be good, not just for the immune system, but it has actually anti-COVID effects. So it's got nice. antiviral effects, but anti-COVID effects as well. Okay. That's, that's huge. Well, uh, Dr. Evans, Joel, thank you so much again for coming on today. How can listeners learn more about you and work with you and learn more about functional medicine as well? Thanks, Andy. So um, great to be here for your interest in functional medicine, ifm.org. And uh, That's the site. It's, a, yep. it's a great site for me. Um, I have a practice at the Center for Functional Medicine. Um, so it's the Center for Functional Medicine.com. Very easy to remember. Um, and uh, emails Joel at the Center for Functional Medicine.com. Love that website. Hopefully you haven't gotten too many bids to try to buy that out. You know, <laughs> it's like a nice website for that. I know. I had to buy it to get it. <laughs> oh, okay. Got it. Yeah. That's great. Well, thanks so much, Joel, for coming on. I really appreciate it. And um, hope you stay healthy and well. You too. Thanks. thanks so much. Thank you for taking the time to listen to us today. If you enjoyed this conversation, please take a moment to leave us a review. It helps our podcast to reach more listeners. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss our next episodes and conversations. And thank you so much again for being with us.